Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Completely my fault, as it turns out. Uh, so, you know, as n n things normally are. So, again, uh, Mitra, why don't you start us off again? Who are you for the fine people who may not know? Um, I'm Mitra Jordan. I'm a clinical um, counselor working out of Victoria, BC. I uh, work with families, individuals, often parents who are worried about their kids and games. Um, I talk a lot about games and technology as well with my clients and with you fine folks too. Hey. <laughs> I was so thrown off course. That this oh, I know. It the, the, it's going to take us a little bit to get back into it. I apologize, chat and <laughs> listeners. Well, they, they, they've they requested that I actually do the entire spoken word to oh. a lovely bunch of coconuts. We, we don't got time for that now. Okay. Don't have, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chad. Blame me. Okay. I'd, but, be, I'd be here for it. I'm the <laughs> evil host. You actually have other things to you say. You were here for it, unfortunately. <laughs> no, um, I loved every second. <laughs> pray for them, people. What goes on? <laughs> but, hi, I am, I am Dr. B, uh, otherwise known as Rafael Bocamazzo. I am the... Clinical director. I am a non-practicing doctor of clinical psychology, though I was clinically trained. I did used to work with people, and I might again in one day, but uh, maybe. Who knows? But I am the clinical director over at TakeThis.org, which since 2012 was, was the very, very first mental health nonprofit to serve the gamer community because we are gamers and we serve both the industry and the and the consumer side and we've got lots of wonderful resources over at takethis.org if you if you go on over there's just some great stuff over there and additionally i'm an expert on the applied use of tabletop role-playing games in clinical and learning settings and and as a special announcement because some wonderful folks called the all rpg valkyries raised a lot of money for take this last year one of the incentives was y that one fan gets to design a bow tie with me and you will get one and i will get one and no one else will get that bow tie and if you go to my twitter account i just just retweeted that and so you can all enter that no purchase and all of that so we're just gonna you you could do a bow tie with me I really so, thought that fun. after you said you can design a bow tie with me, and if I thought you were going, to go, and if you give anyone else that bow tie, I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I do that? Why would it, that is I don't know. That was, I just thought that was you wish. Going. <laughs> if you choose to give the bow tie to somebody, that's fine. But I can say that in an ominous, in an ominous voice that you and I will design a bow tie. It could be cheerful. Yes. Uh, Don't hand it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, before uh, we uh, get into today's topic, uh, I just want to say that starting tomorrow, you can help support Lambert House, an LBGGQ youth community building chari uh, charitable organization based in Seattle, Washington, across all of CNE's games. Uh, uh, you'll be able to, uh, well, let's see, uh, This is, I'm just going to read the direct quote now because it's going to mess me up otherwise. Uh, we will have a uh, charity DLC in Bushwhackers 2 for the next two days and in both Crusaders of the Lost Idols and Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms for the next two weeks. So uh, check out the DLCs in all three of the games, um, and you'll be able to support Lambert House. Get some cool stuff, and, you know, money goes to a good charity, so everybody wins. <laughs> Lambert House is really cool. They are. They are. Um, I, I can't remember. I, I know I've done... I, well, I haven't done stuff with them, but I've done charity stuff like this where it, uh, it supported them. But, I, yeah, no, they're a fantastic uh, organization. Um, but today's topic, culture and marginalization, where do y'all want to start with that? Well, I, I think we should start by letting Mitra lead the way, because this is literally her expertise. It's true. It's true. Finally, you know, I won't, I won't fight you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dr. V, you know you, know after you. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so let's first talk about what culture is. Um, so when we talk about culture, we're talking about the broader culture in which we live, right? So for us, that's North American culture, which is still predominantly Judeo-Christian, which is to say it's influenced a lot by Christmas, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and we broadly all live in a culture where there are social institutions, customs, um, achievements of a particular nation and understanding of our connection to that 
or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we're refugees, if we're new immigrants, if we're first generation, even from a different culture, we carry multiple cultures with us. <clears throat> so when we talk about marginalization um, of individuals, we have to think about um, the cultures that they belong with or feel a connection to or an identity with because culture determines how we understand ourself and our identity or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, for years, I hated the question, where are you from? Because in my family, we go back to multiple migrations on my parents' side, on both sides of their families, um, going back to the great grandparent generation, people moved around. So where are you from becomes difficult to locate from a cultural perspective. Um, though I now do see myself as Canadian to a broad degree, I also see myself as many other things. So, so that's the broader picture of culture that we live in and that we accept. Um, and then we can get into talking about subcultures, which are not lesser than, <laughs> they're just our connection to specific groups. Mm. They exist within the broader culture and accept it for the most part, its rules, its ways of being, but um, they may reject aspects of it too. Mm -hmm. So that's oh, where I, we get into. So, uh, you know, as we were talking yesterday about this, Mitra, and by the way, gang, uh, may, I, maybe at some point we do need to just record and not say for work, definitely unrated pre-production <laughs> meeting as a bonus for <laughs> or something. Because <laughs> it gets oh wacky. Um, <laughs> real when, wacky. when two ADHD people and a person with autism go sit down to have a conversation <laughs> with no filters, <laughs> we go everywhere. It's yes. weird, and we get on, so we really do. We make the most ridiculous jokes. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mitra had a story with uh, ab about not understanding the being around the clinical, uh, the critical role crew. I embarrassed oh, myself in front of the supernatural yes. cast. We tell <laughs> stories like that in the pre production meeting. Um, and it's relevant to this because, you know, one of the things that you said yesterday, Mitra, is that it, so if we define culture broadly, is that culture is kind of like the water we swim in, okay, if we're right. fish. And it, it, it's, it's not only the values and norms, it's not just the traditions, but it's even the language we speak the arts or the music, the movies, et cetera, and the messages conveyed through that, the cultural knowledge, like thinking about all of this referential humor mm -hmm. that might Absolutely. be a part of one culture that someone else from outside of that culture would not understand at all. Like you mentioned Christmas, um, mm -hmm. actually something that was hilarious to me during uh, during this last you know year of COVID was a Muslim college student who tweeted out as if uh, he were an anthropologist experiencing Christmas for the first time. And uh, cause he, he couldn't go home to be with his parents. It's um, that, uh, th that he, he, he tweeted, he just tweeted this all out. And basically he pointed out how weird Christmas was. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we normal, <laughs> we, you know, we, certain things just become, they just are accepted by us. Yeah. Um, in a culture, whether it's Christmas or just the way we function and do things, um, which does seem weird in other cultures, for sure. Yeah, th there was a there was a Jim Gaffigan joke like a decade ago that Christmas sounds like the behavior of a drunk man. I'm going to chop down this tree, bring it in here, take these lights, put them out there, <laughs> put wrapped presents underneath <laughs> for jesus <laughs> but it's, but, it's it, but that's that's one of those knowledge points that if you're raised in that culture it's so obvious that of course you you know you get uh, you you for a month ahead of time prepare for that one day and here's here's this one man who has never experienced it before and he's like what are you people doing i mm -hmm. thought this was one day but instead no this is a part-time job between thanksgiving <laughs> and new year Definitely. are you kidding me <clears throat> And he, he, it was this knowledge piece that he didn't have an anchor point for. And it's, and I know that Mitra, you have so many fascinating things to say about what it's like to be within another culture, not having those quote, obvious anchor points as absolutely. your lens. Yeah, absolutely. 
and this is where I think we were going to talk about um, gamer culture <clears throat> and the broader culture around, um, and I'm not really, the, the, the culture kind of around um, specific, like people who love Doctor Who or people mm -hmm. who fandoms, know about yeah. Star Trek fandoms, the yeah. various fandoms. You mean the correct people. <laughs> See, that's exactly no. it. I'm so sorry. I gotta do See what this. I'm setting oh, you up for this. Mm. I'm setting you up for this. So I think that now, even though the world is more global than it ever was, it's one thing to learn about an experience, a ritual, um, even games through other people's eyes. And it's different to actually experience those things for yourself. Um, so our friend who went home for Christmas um, may have had some idea about what Christmas may have meant, but that's of course not the same as experiencing it in all its little micro steps and the things you do and the things you don't and the things that are expected. And um, one thing about Christmas is when I first got together with my husband, <coughs> We'd gone over to his parents and we were filling Christmas stockings. And so I was, I was wrapping them ahead of time and I was labeling them. And he said, no, 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 what are you doing? You don't ever label Christmas stockings. They're like from Santa. I'm like, <laughs> so I don't, I just put them in the stocking. And put them to you. And he's like, that's right. You don't do that. Which it's a small thing, but you know, it's like the idea that you would label it was impossible for him to understand. And the idea that you wouldn't label a gift was actually quite difficult for me to understand. Here, here's, here's one with stockings <laughs> I had as a kid. I, I did not, because they look, they're, they're, they're feet. Like, you know, they're supposed to be like right? socks and stuff. I tried putting some on my feet and I'm like, these are very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first Christmas stocking I ever got was actually um, a sock with stuff in it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So it wasn't even a stocking. Okay. I had I had very interesting um, experiences with Christmas growing up. But anyway, we leave that for another time. <laughs> um, so if we're going to get into this idea of culture, subculture, and games and fandoms, um, I think one of the first things that would stand out for me is there are people who may really want to participate in this world, but they might not have fluency. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember my first Gen Con where I actually had a fair amount of fluency, but I still felt pretty overwhelmed by the experience because it's all around you and it's, it's massive. Um, and yeah, there were certainly things I didn't understand or personally connect with, but I was with someone who felt like it was his birthday and every Christmas before and he was so super excited to be there for his first ever gen con it was a pleasure we had our kids with us too so it was like you know this fairy tale amazing experience that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. <clears throat> how do we include people in these kinds of experiences and where do we want to go in terms of our discussion about oh, culture oh, we oh, have oh i know <laughs> i know <laughs> i have an idea do. okay so uh -huh. where do we go in our discussion yeah we should mock those who don't fit in uh -huh, uh -huh. And we I'm should, especially here. when Walk. it comes to subcultures that require voluntary associations like gaming, we should absolutely test the knowledge of every single person uh -huh. we encounter to make sure that yeah. they are worthy of being included. That's I helpful, right? I can't even sit still. The whole <laughs> that was that really joke. hard to say with a straight it, it, face. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to point that out. Yeah. It, yeah. That was exactly. so hard to do with a straight face. Good. <laughs> It should be yeah. hard to do with a straight face. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I feel dirty having even said yeah. that. <laughs> we know you don't mean a word. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's, yeah. Because what you were saying yesterday was that, like, you know, in gamer uh, subculture, it's the uh it's the shared history it's like you know the nintendo you know you know the the super famicom all these things like you have the you can talk to someone and have a reference point at a certain point in time that you both experience separately mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's terminology that comes along with those that you're all sharing and whatnot and you can in someone who is in the same subculture you can share that conversation with but to someone on the outside you all sound like you're talking gibberish <laughs> <laughs> It's oh, true. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, um, I was I was with uh, so I this last weekend I got to I got to hang out with friends and family for the first time in over a year because every single person I was hanging out with was one hundred percent fully vaccinated two more than two weeks past post uh, uh, dose two mm. and so many of them were asking me about my job and just trying to explain certain aspects of my job of you know there's language that I use so casually that they're like i'm sorry what no no bring your kids over they'll understand and that's exactly <laughs> how it went mm -hmm. and uh it's it's just inundated for me the idea of well you know there's a d6 and what's a d6 i'm like oh that's right okay mm -hmm. and so yeah it, it it's it's so strange to to not realize you're doing that and then have to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Right. So the more we live in a specific subculture, whether it's gaming or a different um, a different one, or or if we live in a in a, in another culture that's marginalized within the broader culture, right? Which used to happen a lot to immigrants, right? They'd be they'd be like Little Italy, and there still is, right? And there wouldn't be the same level. Of, of connection to the culture outside of that. Um, I remember at one point I worked indirectly with school kids. I used to work at a historic site um, and there were kids who came from the area where there were a lot of um, Portuguese people had settled in Toronto. And most of these kids didn't really speak English terribly well because they really didn't practice it at home and they were still in grade school. So they hadn't had quite as many years. So. And a lot of them were in school and in the same community. Now, this happens less and less, but because I think we do have um, more connections to cultures across the globe and a little bit more of a connection, even in communities. But this used to happen quite a bit. And it, if we're talking about smaller groups, then we're talking about a shared language, a shared understanding, a shared way of being. And we might come into it in an inherited way in terms of our culture, our origin and our ethnicity, or we might come into it in a way where we're choosing it, which is what we talk about with gaming culture. We're choosing to engage in something. It's a choice to participate or not to participate, which is not the same with all of our cultural experiences or even our marginal experiences. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's a culture we choose. So one example, one example I, I know I discussed with you both yesterday was when I when I was married, I married into a Jewish family, and I was raised very Catholic because you know you speaking you know speaking of the you know the ethnic conclaves within larger cities, in Seattle we essentially used to have a little little uh, little Italy, uh, which was affectionately called Garlic Gulch, yeah. and uh, that's where my grandparents hmm. landed, and uh, so the you know I was raised. Catholic and one of the interesting one of the interesting discussion points in my marriage was uh, how we just sort of perceive the world naturally and I would uh, <laughs> I I joked I used to joke with her that I used I, I used to experience guilt in Latin I still do um, <laughs> that you know, I mean, anytime I'm sorry about something, it's like, ah, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It's just, it's ingrained in there. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I have images of stained glass windows and angels and incense being thrown everywhere and all of that. And it's just, it's ingrained. Yeah. yeah. It will probably never go away. Is that kind of what you're talking about? The lens that regardless it of- It is, it is. And it's, it's, a, it's things that we take for, it's not even that we take them for granted. They're just part of our experience. They're part of how we make meaning in the world. Um, and in terms of cultural psychology, they're a part that's sometimes been missed, which is the way these lenses um, create our meaning and the way we may misunderstand or think we're sharing the same experience when we're not. Right. And we're starting now, I think, to take that less and less for granted in people's experience. At least um, I like to think certainly on this show and, and in many of the people I meet, we're being much more sensitive to how each person might be perceiving the world. Um, when you talk about guilt, where I go is actually shame mm -hmm. because I grew up part of the time, at least in a shame based culture, not a guilt based one. What's the and difference? So, Okay, so that's a good question. So a guilt-based culture is 
um, oh, I got it wrong. I should have done this thing. A shame-based culture is I'm a terrible person. Um, and I now, I, I, shame is what keeps you in line overall in culture. Guilt is, oh, I'm having trouble with this one. And I'm usually, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting should have known. distinction. It is an interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that in a guilt-based culture, what are you feeling when you get something wrong? Oh, I feel I feel shame. Okay, you feel shame. Yeah. But feel, when you I said feel... you felt guilt and it's Catholic guilt, what is the experience of that? Well, did I breathe somebody else's air? <laughs> right. So it's partly taking up space, but what did you what did you miss do? Is there regret around what you didn't get? Oh right? yeah, no, I should I I I am a sinner unto the eyes of everyone. Right. Wait, they, okay. I didn't realize we were going to be doing confession here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suppose I, somebody should absolve me. Okay. <laughs> so it's interesting because the more I study um, regulation and the sense of sort of we've talked about the window of tolerance on this show several times, but the more, the more I look at that, the more there is that closer connection with guilt and shame than um, was than I certainly previously thought in terms of how we embody it. Mm -hmm. But the experience of shame is about not what you feel, not your mortification, your regret, your sadness, not that individual piece as much, but it's the shared experience within the community of getting something wrong. So you violated a cultural norm. I violated a cultural norm. It would be it, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, and potentially bring dishonor to my family. Now, my family really would have rolled their eyes at that concept, by the way. I was fortunate to grow up in a fairly liberal, multicultural family, but that's the idea. It's about the reputation. It's about the mm. uh, perception of your family. So it's more about the... Um, connected social experience versus the individual experience. The responsibility ends up being carried by everyone. The shame colors those around you. Well, I'm really, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're actually getting absolution from the chat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, yeah, actually, is... one that, one that I did want to um, call yeah, you, I usually I... save these for later, but uh, uh -huh. uh, Monkey House uh, said, shame is public, guilt can be public, uh, publicly expressed, but you uh, doesn't have to be. And that was where their distinction lied in there. And do tara me to do, I'm going to say that wrong. It's okay, I always though. do. <laughs> Guilt is when I mess up. Shame is when everyone, everybody else sees. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. pretty much. And some cultures are based more on the other than the one. So we've really moved away from where we were initially going with this. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. It, 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 but, that, the, but that's still, that is part of both of your cultures. Like, that, that's what you grew up in. That is an example Guilt? of yeah. that. I, I feel exactly. like that is actually part of this conversation codified uh, distilled guilt yeah yeah it's, and, it's and also an explanation of if somebody from outside of either of your cultures came in would not understand what's going on because they are not having the same mental reaction that you would in that situation so ingrained yeah exactly, <laughs> so exactly. And, and, and you see like i i grew up without a lot of religious influence um so i just you know i i i'm looking at these from outside both of them <laughs> like the reference points i have were movies that i watched as a kid um but what one of the things that i i know that we wanted to talk about was th that we touched on a little bit ago was the whole like keeping someone out of a culture by way of making them feel bad that they don't automatically know it Mm -hmm. Right. So I think I called it the one up, one down game, but it's essentially in group, out group stuff. Um, so if I'm part of a group, I have a couple of choices. I can gatekeep or I can invite in, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if I'm inviting in, but not in a good way, I can haze. Yeah. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. Sort of a bit of hazing, bullying, ensuring that people don't feel like that, that the one up, one down piece is essentially 
perhaps using a reference or two that someone's not going to gra grasp mm -hmm. and then saying, what? You've never played X? Yeah. Or you haven't watched X? How can you call yourself a gamer if you, yeah. right? Um, Worst uh, console ever. Worst console ever. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just being the comic book guy. Um, Basically. But <laughs> like, like the... I think like this is this is a little bit of a side, but the thing that really breaks my brain about people who do this is the people who seek out to do this. They seek out people to test as uh, in their culture. My my wife well, uh, yesterday when I was talking about what today's topic was going to be, brought up a story. She used to work at GameStop, and a guy came in and was asking her the difference between the PS4 and the PS4 Pro. And she talked to him for 20 minutes answering all these questions. And he was like, uh, but we, this one's got a hard drive. This is a solid state. What's the difference? She's like, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not uh, in, into that sort of stuff. I don't really know. He goes, ha, got you. And walked out. Yeah. He literally talked to, wasted 20 minutes of my wife's time testing her to see yep. if she was worthy to work at GameStop. Yeah. The one up, one down game. In order to make myself feel better, I have to put you down. Yeah. It happens in, it happens all the time. Um, gaslighting is a form, well, gaslighting is a much broader topic. Mm. But that, that could be a, a whole other one to itself, yes. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and, and, but you, you were saying how there is the, the invitational way and there's the hazing versus the uh right the, the great because yeah like that that is the the hazing one is the like oh i can't believe you haven't seen this but dr b you were actually talking yesterday about like mm -hmm. something that you've changed up in your in your verbiage yeah it was a, it was a relatively simple change i made because really because i always knew my intentions mm -hmm. okay but you know intentions don't always get expressed and i'm i'm always excited when people are, are discovering new things, but I'm also sometimes surprised because something is so obvious to me because I've lived with it my entire life. So you haven't seen Star Wars Episode Four. <laughs> what I'm expressing is astonishment and surprise. What they're hearing is judgment and yep. you know reproach. Yeah. And the same words, uh, different so different subtexts. So instead, um, I can't believe you haven't. I have just simply changed it to, I'm excited for you to discover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited for you to learn. I'm excited. I'm instead of, I can't believe it's I'm excited because, um, another big example. I, I love, I love the show. Good place. I think it is maybe the, po I, the most perfect Praise story arc Saint ever Kristen. written on network television. <laughs> and, Somebody recently was like, uh, said to me, I'm going to watch The Good Place for the first time. I'm like, the first time? <gasps> I'm so jealous you get to see it for the first time. <laughs> yeah. And that created a very different tone of conversation. And they, they actually told me that, you know, you're the first person that's expressed excitement instead of astonishment that I haven't seen mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. we ended up having this fantastic conversation and they could see me like vibrating with things that I didn't want to tell them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and so that change, that simple change of phrasing of you haven't versus I'm excited mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that has made all the difference. Um, and I, I imagine, and I want to, I want to throw this to Mitra that depending on how insular a culture may be, because there are certainly cultures that do, do have, you know, actual gatekeeping as steps to be considered part of that culture. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mentioned in my marriage, my, when my wife was Jewish and there was discussion over me for the sake of, you know, family unity, uh, converting to Judaism. And that is a long process. Mm -hmm. That is a really long process. And so depending on how insular a culture is, is it appropriate to use that excitement bit of, I want to experience something in your culture instead of you haven't, but I'm excited for you to try. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. appropriate? I think it depends on the culture, right? I think in terms of a generally open culture that accepts the broader culture as part of its um, experience, then yes. I think there are cultures where maybe um, if you're saying, I'm coming into your culture and I'm excited to, for you to experience something about mine, then that really depends on the culture because then that can look like you don't accept my culture as it is. 
Hmm. You feel that in order for us to connect, this other piece is important, which it may be, right? And it may not be. But you want to step carefully if you're entering another person's experience or world that you don't have experiences with yourself. Hmm. If you are the one doing the welcoming, then for sure, right? Then for sure. Because I know for myself, um, coming to Canada at 16 wasn't easy. Um, there were so many cultural references I really didn't get, particularly at that point, it's not like there was the internet. So there were a lot of, I'd seen Star Wars, but I didn't see it till I was 12. And I certainly saw Star Trek, but that was once I came to Canada. So there were a lot of things that I knew about and were floating around, but none that I really had regular access to uh, growing up um, until the age of 16-ish. So coming to Canada was like trying to get, trying to understand all of the cultural references around me, mm -hmm. because we don't even think about the cultural references associated with how we dress, but they're there for to be read by those who do understand. And so you're walking around without translation, which can feel very alienating. Um, and so think about somebody going to a gaming convention for the first time, um, even a small tabletop game convention, right? And they see people dressed in costume and they see this world that they may want to engage in, but they may really not understand what's going on. They may really want to. That's a moment where you're standing at the threshold of something where it's really easy to feel like this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I can't be part of this. Like no matter how much I long to be, maybe it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. And that's a key point that um, we want to make around accepting and welcoming people. But it's also, um, I want to encourage people who feel a little overwhelmed in that environment. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to settle in and slowly explore and don't let anyone put you off from engaging with things that you think you're going to love or that maybe in some ways you already do love. Maybe you've played a few games and you just think this is the best. Mm -hmm. You know, check out a games cafe or go to a small convention. And even if it feels overwhelming, you know, just there's still something here for you. Yeah. For sure. So it, it also sounds like we have to be aware of what we're we're talking about as we go into this. And there's a there's an awareness of primary culture, which is somebody's core if if I'm understanding you correctly, primary culture is this core almost in in certain respects immutable identity. Um that, you know, the the example of bringing up earlier that I will probably always feel guilt in Latin. Mm. Um, regardless of what happens in my life. It was just yeah. there for so long during I mean, my formative years. Yeah, how you approach that guilt may change, right? You don't change your formative years, but the eyes with which you view them, that mm. can be different, mm -hmm. right? Um, I grew up in at a time in a South Asian culture in Pakistan where people really didn't acknowledge the LGBT uh, community at all. There wasn't um, there wasn't an overt one in any way, but that didn't really affect my comfort, connection with, participation in, um, and I mean, pride's a big part of my life in June, mm -hmm. you know, but, but that wasn't what I grew up with, yeah. but I don't hold any of those perspectives that uh, that were around me when I grew up and I was very fortunate I grew up with a grandparent who was totally comfortable and connected to the idea that some people are gay mm -hmm. big deal just because we don't talk about it in this culture doesn't mean it doesn't happen right so and it's not a, not an issue so I was fortunate there not to have held the biases or the bigotry that can also exist but, you know, lots of people overcome the messages that they grew up with in their culture. Yeah. So, and yeah, you have experiences that are key, but you view them through different eyes. Boy, I said that in a long way. And no, no, <laughs> hey, no, that was good. That was good. Um, but before we continue, uh, let's remind our viewers and listeners of our disclaimer, and then we'll be back with a little bit more about this. 
Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Okay, so before we uh, pass over to chat to see what they've been up to, one of the top, one of the points that I, I think that we should definitely hit because we kind of jumped around on our on our little note thing, uh, but it worked out. Uh, was uh, third culture kids and cultural hybrids? Oh yeah. Um. What 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 is what is that? Okay, so um, a third culture kid is a person who is raised outside of the their passport country um, and might have multiple experiences in different cultures through their formative years. And this could be because parents moved around for one reason or another, sometimes because they were posted to various countries to work, sometimes because uh, they grew up on a military base, um, sometimes because of some upheaval in their family. So um, a person who has immigrant or refugee experience can be a third culture kid, although refugee experiences are different and can bring up a whole host of other um, kinds of complex trauma that go along with that. Um, but essentially it's through your formative years, you grow up outside of the culture that is your parents' culture, maybe multiple different cultures. So for me, I had three cultures outside of my passport country, which were formative as I was growing up. Um, and what this means is that you bring these multiple cultural experiences with you and that you hate the question, where are you from? Um, and you may see yourself as a global nomad, someone who could settle or live somewhere else. Your sense of home might be a little bit fragmented. It's not a terrible thing. Uh, usually there's a lot of enrichment in one's life. Usually there's a lot of real benefits that come with it, but it can also cause confusion and some challenges in terms of mm, figuring out who you are and where you'd like to be in the world. Okay. Um, so what is... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm checking check the notes. Yeah, it's good. You're going over <laughs> oh, I, our yeah. I, I want to make sure that we because <laughs> we because we did hit a lot of good topics during our our conversation yesterday. Um, and what one of them that we had under uh the the third culture kids is uh, uh complications of developing self identity within the context of covert and overt exclusion. And this is that sounds like a note I wrote. Yes, it did. That it was really a is. Lot a, I'm of pretty sure that's necessary. you. <laughs> yeah. Also, covert, overt. Some of my favorite words besides shenanigans. Um. Uh. So. Because we talked about this with the with the subculture of being uh, excluded from it and um, having because uh, another point that we didn't uh, quite touch on was the the anchor points of how like there are mm. um, th there's something that you can uh, relate to within the culture that is similar but if you're in one that is such an extreme difference from it you may not have those anchor points to to understand what is going on there you, you know you're talking about with the viewing christmas from someone who has no idea what the heck christmas is mm -hmm. there's no anchor point for that mm -hmm. so what what oh god how do you explain tinsel do, oh my god right? we put this fire hazard in our house for a whole month <laughs> And then we light candles and hot lights all around it. Like, I, yeah, it, you know. <laughs> um, okay, I'll give you a really yeah. strange one. We, th we, we buy special bags to throw away our garbage. That is one that I found out recently that I did not know wasn't a thing in other places. And 
And it wasn't until then that I really took a step back. I'm like, that is really freaking weird. <laughs> right? So it's it there's all kinds of 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 uh, little things, you know. So it's that in special scented bags. <laughs> <laughs> special scented bags. It's true. It's, it's so true. true. So yeah. the so the smell of lavender can mix in with the smell of old salad greens. <laughs> you know you love it. Like oh. That was yesterday. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, so um, anchor points. Well, so so what 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 are some of the Wait, complications we'll... of developing self identity as a third culture kid? You talked a little bit at one point about um, subcultures and anchor points, and I was reminded. I immediately went to being ten in Iran right before the Russian Revolution. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm really with the program today. My apologies. So Stag. Mitra is in fact right immortal. And, uh, <laughs> really a vampire. No, it, it, she, obviously, she's gonna take right us before both the out. Iranian revolution, I have no idea why <laughs> suddenly the Russian revolution came to mind. <laughs> Except I will say my grandmother kind of was in Russia shortly after that revolution. Oh, there wow. you go. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, but back to Iran. So I was about 10 and I was with my grandmother and I remember getting this, it was like an accounting book. It was like a nice, big, long ledger sort of. Um, and I, I started filling it with these symbols and creating a whole different language, creating a language and a culture. So there was a way to speak it. And then I remember writing about people's dress and, and it was completely invented. And honestly, I think 10 year old me was just really trying to cope mm. with all of the upheaval and change and suddenly being somewhere else again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, I think that depending on who you are, um, as a child, it can be immensely confusing um, because you don't have enough reference points as it is. You don't have enough context around you. And this is one of the challenges with third culture kids is um, as an adult, even if you don't know Christmas and you're blown away by the idea of tinsel and, and how strange it is, you can kind of go, oh, well, at Eid, we do these things. Or at Yom Kippur, this is the thing. And we have a connection to ritual and our understanding of its place in our world and traditions and what I grew up with and what you mm -hmm. grew up with. And so there's that common ground from which to talk about these things. Um, and when you're a child, you don't really have any of that yet because context is something we develop with experience where we can talk about this way of being or that way of being or this house I lived in or that part of the world and we can kind of make sense of it but you don't have that as a kid it's just like everything in my landscape changed completely mm -hmm. I now don't speak the language I don't know all of the basics like where do we go to get food how do we cook it What's a samovar? Because they had samovars for their tea. Mm. A samovar looks like a massive urn. And it's kind of ring-shaped. And in the center, you used to have coal. And you used to have a teapot on top of it. And the hot water was in the sort of donut ring oh, around okay. it. And then you'd have a spigot. So you'd add your very strong tea and then you'd add your water. Anyway. Whoa, I just Googled that. That looks cool. Right? Sorry. So, I, <laughs> no, that's great. I didn't mean to go house awesome shopping. The professionals. Yeah, you know. So, you'd, you know, you'd go to someone's house for tea, and they didn't just put the kettle on and pour a cuppa. They had these massive urns mm -hmm. that were heated with coals. And some people had fancy electric ones, like, come on. But I'm sure they're all electric these days. But in any case, the coal did add a really nice flavor to your tea, kind of smoky. But mm -hmm. I digress. Mm -hmm. My ADHD and full flowering today, people. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was like these things, like, how do I make tea? Like, you know, that's mm -hmm. all different. Not that I was making tea much as a kid. My point is that you see the world around you and people's solutions for things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how we eat, how we educate, how we govern, what we believe in terms of religion, if there is a religion that we are all buying into. Um, and, you know, all of that stuff affects how we live our daily life. Mm hmm. So, yeah. Well, um, before we check in with chat, any last thoughts on culture marginalization that you want to get in there? 
So one of the challenges with being a cultural marginal, that is having these experiences that then exclude you even from your own culture, right? I call it having a hybrid identity. Um, it means that I belong in these ways and I don't belong in those. Or I belong in all ways, but I'm not going to be understood in all of them. Because chances are, there's going to be a number of people around me who don't share my experience. I mean, my entire family, well, not my entire family, mm -hmm. my created family, my mm -hmm. kids and my partner did not grow up with these experiences. And when I mention them, they're kind of like, whoa, you know, because they've got stability and they've got one place, which I love for them, actually. Um, and they're all into traveling. But yeah, it means that there are parts of you that you see that no one else does on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And although it's a very different experience, I think many people who seriously enjoy the world of games, whether it's video games or whether it's D&D, will sometimes feel in their lives that there are many people in the broader culture who don't understand what that experience means to them. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, not the same as the kind of hybrid identity I'm talking about, but it touches on some of the same feelings that might come up. Mm -hmm. So, look at that. Um, and oh, go just ahead. just really briefly adding to that, we've said this on the show many times before, and I think it's it's important to reiterate this that feeling a sense of community and inclusion um, is one of the most protective factors against a variety of mental health challenges and. Uh, over and uh, one of the most useful things in bolstering your overall resilience. And so especially when it comes to our chosen uh, subcultures that we participate in, be welcoming to others, gang. Just be cool, be groovy. You're there by choice. Someone else be, is there by choice. You're not going to, you're really going to do more harm than good by excluding them instead of welcoming them. Simple language changes, just... I'm glad you get to experience that instead you ha instead of you haven't. Yeah. It's a big and, it's a big shift. Yeah. And the other piece is there might be a spouse along who's not that into games but they want to support mm -hmm. their partner who's really into being there or doing whatever. You know, be welcoming of them too. See if there's ways you can help them engage um, and be part of things. Help them discover their own inner gaming mm -hmm. self even if it's to a smaller degree. Than I, those around them. I thought Candy about this. <laughs> I thought about this earlier when you were talking about like you know even if you don't understand what's going on in the subculture, like you know be you know uh, accepting of it and stuff like that. Like m one of my moms is really taught me that from a young age because uh, when I was twelve, she took me to Comic Con for the first time. My that that mom is not nerdy in any way. Like that's that's not her shtick. Like she doesn't she doesn't know what's going on there. And yeah. it was so great because, um, you know, she brought me home and my other mom was like, how was it? And she's like, I didn't understand anything that was going on, but there were a <laughs> lot of half-dressed ladies, so that was great. Uh <laughs> but, but, like, she, she, she took me to Comic-Con for probably three or four years straight. And never once understood anything going on. And she always told me, she's like, I don't get this, but I can see how much you enjoy it and what you get out of it. So I'm happy to take you there for it, even if I'm confused for four hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. The more you talk about your moms, the more I want to meet them. Oh, God. Oh, you <laughs> that's lovely. That is just the best. And I think that's, that's it. You know, often when I work with parents, I'm trying to get this across to them. Enter your kid's world. Yes. Be part of it with them. If they want to show you YouTube videos, if they want to show you memes, if they want to show you whatever, be there for mm -hmm. that. Show up. You don't have to understand everything. Let them be the expert. Let yeah. them educate you. Yeah. That's half the fun for them. They get to know something you don't. That's the best, especially if you have less context in life, which <laughs> we just said they do. So. Um. So it, we're, we're we're getting towards the end here. So let, let's let's check in with chat, and I I'm gonna actually skip ahead a little bit down to uh oh boy Dotoroma eto do. I was really close to saying Dormammu. I've come to bargain. Uh, <laughs> uh, how how can you help your child if uh you're the immigrant and your child is born away from your birth country? 
I'm going I, to say silent here. I don't know. <laughs> I I can I can help with that. Um, how can you help your child? Um, so what are we helping them do? Are we helping them figure out the culture around them? Are we helping them because the culture around them is different, so you don't have the same roadmaps, right? I mean, I'd say that's probably where you're, I'm thinking that's probably where you're coming from. Um, yeah, that's a tough one because you do have to figure out what the roadmaps are for them in the culture that you now live. Um, and I know this was a bit of a challenge for me, not because I wasn't, fam I had the experience of growing up here somewhat, but um, asking other parents, connecting with other parents. If there is an organization that kind of supports um, immigrants, even if you're familiar with the culture, there might be other parents there you want to connect with to talk about that and maybe even to offer some guidance to them because sometimes in offering that kind of guidance, you actually figure out solutions for yourself as well. So, and mostly being present for your kid and their experience um, and being around these younger people and see what their culture is like. Because one thing you're good at when you're an immigrant is noticing other cultures. Mm. You've already become an anthropologist you already have had to adjust to one. Understanding to the youth culture, or understanding the youth culture around you and your kids' experience is just a piece of that. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's. There was another question that I wanted to get to in here, and it said question, but now my eyes aren't focusing. There it is. Reaver01. Question. How damaging is it to uh, personally reject certain aspects of a culture you have no real choice in being a part of and forced to work with? That's a question. That is a question, which is why I wanted to field it. <laughs> yeah. How damaging is it to personally reject aspects that don't it sounds like those aspects don't work for you, mm -hmm. but you have to engage with the culture. Well, that's a form of, in some ways, healthy resistance, right? You know, uh, I don't know the context, so I can't say how I would advise or, or, or connect with or help you with your expertise with this one. But um, I think that it depends, but the healthy resistance, paying attention to what's true for you is an important piece because we want to understand who we are so that we're not just angry about this rejection or feeling trapped. We need to work with those feelings um, in order to understand what it is we're tolerating. And at some point, maybe your decisions will change, but um, it's important, I think, not to bypass your own feelings and not to, um, try to kind of transcend them because if there's something you're rejecting or very uncomfortable with that's that's a truth right and if you're kind of covering it over or pretending it's not there that's going to do more damage to you mm -hmm. so um the, so the 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 last couple ones that i'm going to do is is just a, a couple of good comments that were uh brought out during the the episode that jay grabbed uh also jay did put in uh when talking about the uh russian revolution that uh this is ju uh, this just in mitra is actually a god uh <laughs> i i was really scared she was gonna start beheading us because there can be no, only one and, and it's gonna be mitra in the end <laughs> oh gosh um uh babylon rager 2261 said uh that's fair christmas is a mishmash of different things and taken uh all together is pretty odd and that yeah no it's pretty true um let's see tiny pencils uh having to explain who uh bifana is aka the italian christmas witch to non-italians is always fun that was sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> just just yeah. just for anybody who understands this my grandmother while she was still alive in the what used to be the italian neighborhood in seattle she was considered the neighborhood strega so it <laughs> <laughs> that's for like the two of you who understood that <laughs> Um, mom 23 red says, uh, my mom doesn't play games. I am a gamer. My kids are gamers. She doesn't understand many of our conversations. And I totally understand that. I, um, I got to see some of my family for the first time a few weeks ago and my two nephews are 
really into D and D now. They are ten and eleven, and they they are they are just I want to play D and D all the time. And so like they're running up to me and talking about they know lore now. By the way, they're like they they rub they're just like do you know about Minsk the Mighty or Bruno or Bad? I'm just like children, children. Oh my god. Oh my um, heart. Yeah, that is so great. And and I and I'm in and I absolutely love like. <laughs> It's really quick. We started up, we played a game, then we uh, had, broke for dinner, and then afterwards my, my 10 year old comes up to me, he's just like, Yo, Uncle Trevor, can we can please continue our adventure? And my heart just melted. I was like, yes, of course, we can play as much D&D as you want. But like, I'm having these conversations with the, these kids and no one else there is there like, I don't even come close to understanding <laughs> what you're saying but you seem to be having fun whatever <laughs> i think that's great yeah and by the way that's mom two three reds oh two three reds yeah because she has three redheads uh, uh and she's awesome well played well played <laughs> yeah uh, then, uh, uh, this is, uh, PC Mothor says, uh, aren't many cultures a combination of guilt and shame based? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, what, what it comes down to, and in, in some ways it has to do with whether a culture is more individualistic in focus mm -hmm. or more, um, related, connected, um, What's the word? Jeez, I, you know, really today. I it's don't know. okay. It's one of those days. Um, it really is. It really is. So it's whether you're more about the social and familial connections within a culture versus yourself as an individual. So relational versus individual. See, I knew I'd get there. There you go. So, mm hmm. Um, the, uh, I think the last one that, uh, I'm going to read out before we start doing the outro. Uh, this is from, uh, ooh, Eris. It's, it's got Stargazer in it. You Stargazer, you know you know who you are. Um, hey all, I signed up uh, for Twitch just so I could uh, thank you for the stream. After hearing the ADHD episode, I felt seen, made an appointment with a care provider, and she was and she very quickly was like, "Yeah, you've got it." Uh, oh my heart! Now I've got yes. meds, and I'm seeking a counselor, and it's directly thanks to this feed. So we, I'm very very happy that we were able to help you with that, and you know help you along on that journey. And I'm glad that it's helping you. I am a puddle of butter on the floor right now. <laughs> That's so great. I'm so glad. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I I hope I I do genuinely hope that each one of these streams helps at least one of you out there in some way with it, um, because we do really enjoy having these conversations and seeing uh, stuff like that uh, makes it worth it. So. Um, uh, that is going to be all we have time for for this week's discussion. Uh, Meet your Dr. B. Where can people find you on the interwebs? On the interwebs on Twitter, <laughs> at Mitra Jordan is my handle, and I'm at MitraJordan.com, and you are welcome to reach out to me both ways. It's always a pleasure. And you can find me on all of the socials at the Dr. B, T H E E D O C T O R B as in boy. And, uh, you know, if you go to my Twitter account, you can see the retweets for the bow tie contest that you can all enter to design a bow tie with me. You would get one, I would get one, and nobody else would get one. But more importantly, you and should absolutely you follow Take This on Take the, at Take This Org on all of the socials and go check out the website at takethis.org. Yep. Uh, secret bow tie. Secret bow tie. <laughs> that was so. That just came out of left. <laughs> uh, I actually think the bow tie. If you, if anyone in chat wins, I su I suggest a bow tie that on one side says uh, "be cool" and then the other side "be groovy." That like Doctor B said earlier in the show. Um, uh, also, uh, really quickly, want to remind you all that uh, I'm going to just read verbatim. I'm starting tomorrow. You can help support Lambert House, an LGBTQ youth community building ch uh, charitable organization based in Seattle, Washington, across all of our games. Uh, we will have uh, charity DLC and Bushwhackers 2 for the next two days, and in both Crusaders of the Lost Idols and Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms for the next two weeks. So please check those out and support an awesome cause. Uh, you can find me on the Difficulty Class podcast every Friday and on Champions of Lore every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on twitch.tv slash CNE Games. So I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at the Trevor. There is an A hiding in there and all of the numerous podcasts that I do and won't stop. Uh, 
<laughs> thank you to Jay for moderating in the chat as always. And thank you to Codename Entertainment and Take This for giving us an opportunity to have these conversations. If you missed any part of this show, you can listen to it later as a podcast at 2 p.m. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, you can send them into Champions of Psychology at CodenameEntertainment.com. And we are going to be coming back for season three at some point soon this year. So we need your suggestions. We want to know what you're, you want us to talk about. We, I, we already had somebody on Twitter ask, you know, where can I send those in? There it is right there. You can tweet it. Uh, I, I, I won't speak for them. You can tweet it at me, and, and I will definitely add it to the list of things. Uh, but, uh, yeah, please give us your suggestions. Um, if you're here with us live right now, be sure to come back at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Bardic Inspiration with Dylan and Jason Charles Miller. Uh, and if you're listening to us later, we hope to see you next week here in the chat because chat does have a, a good time when people aren't arguing about Saturday Night Live. Uh, <laughs> so uh, until next week. Take care of yourself. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment.